Welcome back to The In Chamber. I'm your host, Tom Schumann. It's not unusual to begin an episode such as this by saying the vote for the 2020 election is less than one month away. But the reality is the vote has been ongoing for quite some time. Another phrase of the past is that elections, campaigns, really shifted into high gear after Labor Day. Well, just as with the early voting just mentioned, 24-7 news cycles, the reach of social media, the better way to look at it today might be, are we ever not in campaign election season? Nevertheless, nevertheless, we are approaching the culmination of the 2020 election. There's no shortage of stories or angles to discuss. Helping us do so today is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Indianapolis and a frequent commentator on elections and politics. Laura Merrifield Wilson, welcome to the In Chamber. Yes, so thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. We, we've enjoyed your, your analysis uh, with our Biz Voice, Biz Voice magazine in the past as a roundtable participant and guest columnist. Uh, full disclosure here, we are having this, recording this conversation the day after the first presidential debate. So a little bit of a lag time before you're hearing it. With that in mind, uh, coming off uh, the, the September 29th presidential debate, uh, I got to ask your reactions to what we saw and heard uh, in that first uh, debate. Well, there are a lot of words I could use that my mother would frown upon, but I can say dumpster fire and she'd probably just roll her eyes. So that's, that's the phrase that's how I'd characterize it. Um, oh my goodness. I know we were expecting a, a contentious, raucous affair and uh, no one was dissatisfied if that's what they were really looking for. Um, I think both candidates... <laughs> They achieved what they wanted to achieve. Um, but, but the worst thing, you know, this is the problem, Tom. My, my fear with a debate like that, where people come out swinging, true bloodbath, dumpster fire, however you want to describe the show, it was messy. Uh, my, my biggest fear is always that people who are watching, who maybe didn't make up their minds yet about who they're going to vote for, who aren't always politically engaged. And I know it's a really small niche of folks that were watching, but nonetheless, uh, they watch that and then they're turned off from politics indefinitely or at minimum from this election. And I think when our politics get so negative and we certainly have that kind of political climate right now, I'm sure we'll talk about that later, uh, you always risk the opportunity of disenfranchising folks. Um, and that's, I think in a democracy, that's obviously very problematic. I think that's also really unfortunate because debates should, uh, should serve to educate and inform. And if they're upsetting people and if they're disenfranchising them, but they're not serving their purpose at all. I think you're right on target there, as you said, especially with those who may not be, tend to be politically engaged. To, to witness that, they, they just may not, may be totally disengaged after that, and hopefully that's not the case. But let's, uh, let's turn to the voting a little bit. I made reference to that in, in the opening, you know, and, and by the time, and again, people are listening to this, I, for one, will uh, have voted at one of the early voting centers. And in the absentee ballots, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who will cast those ballots before November 3rd. Uh, you know, are there really that many undecided voters this year, you think, as we head into this final month? The numbers are hard to pinpoint, but you didn't ask me numbers, so I guess I don't have to give you a specific statistic. I think there are certainly still undecided voters, and probably many of those that, that frame it as a lesser of two evils conversation. Oftentimes we hear that in American politics, right? You're not in love with one candidate or the other, uh, but you still want to cast your ballot. It, the, the biggest challenge for these people is deciding ultimately who they are going to support. And of course, we do have third-party candidates. I want to give a shout out to them. It's a deeply entrenched two-party system. And so for, for many voters who maybe weren't enthralled with either Biden or Trump, and maybe they, they actually supported a different candidate who's no longer in the race, they have the opportunity to make up their minds, small fraction of folks, they could skip voting for president and, and vote later down on the ballot. We, we know it's a small group of people, but it could be an important group of people nonetheless. And certainly from the campaigns and the candidates' perspective, they need that 51% to win. So those undecided voters, they're up for grabs as small and, and, and as a you know, really potentially very small minority as they might be. They're important to the candidates to try to influence to, to get that majority to win. Yeah, you know, we talk about independent voters a lot, but a but question about the, the age and the demographics there. President Trump and Joe Biden are the two oldest candidates to ever run for president. Yet you look at, at Indiana and one third of the Hoosiers registered to vote are under the age of 40. Does that matter? 
it, it certainly has an impact. I, it would not necessarily be the end all be all. I think there are a lot of voters that care much more about, uh, quite frankly, partisanship. Uh, they care about certain issues that they prioritize as being important to them. And then they, they do look at the candidates. Are they reflective of of their values? And to your point, which I think is, is a really valid one here, the age and generation gaps are meaningful in politics. Maybe not the end all be all. I certainly have many political things in, in common with people that aren't my age or generation. But those lived experiences, those perspectives that we know do change over time, they do change with generations as well. And we would expect a, a disconnect there. It's a challenge uh, in politics always when uh, you do have candidates that are of a certain age and you have voters that are a different age, uh, but even like their youngest voters, oftentimes low voter turnout, uh, they're not necessarily going to participate. So it's a, a moving target for candidates and campaigns as they're trying to make sure their candidates appealing to a majority of people, including voters. And so voters may not always have things in common with them like age. So I know it's a terribly complicated answer in some ways, but right. I would say age matters, but only to the extent that the other things in terms of partisanships and issues and the prioritization of policies to the extent that those don't matter. Laura, there seems to be a fairly good consensus around the, the, the states that are going to make the difference here in the presidential election. Uh, I'll name off seven of them and, and that, that most people seem to, to, again, coalesce around, ask you to either comment on a couple of those or ones that you see as, as truly being the kind of the, the difference makers on, a, on election night and maybe election week following election night or month following election night. I don't know. Uh, my attempt at humor there, but those seven states, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, which of those kind of jump out to you? Florida, uh, hands down. If I, if I had to pick one, and I, you allowed me to pick a couple, but I would certainly say Florida first and foremost. Um, Florida has been at the center of this election for quite some time. Uh, this question about uh, which candidate's going to be able to to capture their interest and, and, and certain things that are going on in Florida, too, in terms of felony voting, um, re-enfranchisement of felony voting rights that happened two years ago. It's become another political issue in Florida. Um, so people who have served their felony sentences before were entirely disenfranchised afterwards. Um, the state of Florida changed that, but they're also now looking at adjusting it a little bit more. Mike Bloomberg has spent a lot of money down there. When you look demographically, sometimes they tend to advantage a Republican candidate because they do tend to be older voters in Florida. People retire, you know, sunbirds down there. Um, and also you have Cuban-American voters, and uh, Cuban tends to be more conservative. It, Florida's been that toss-up state. Florida's been one of those that we've been watching, and it, it does come with a considerable number of electoral college votes. I, I think when you look at other states that are important in North Carolina and Ohio, and again, in part because they are seen as toss up. They're seen as that blue. It's not guaranteed they're going to go one way or another for a candidate. And they're, they're carrying a lot of weight as well. Um, and the one last thing I'd say, this isn't terms of this in particular states uh, specifically, but looking at demographic regions. In 2016, we saw the blue wall crumble, if you will. Like These are states we, we talk about, like Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, states that we thought would probably go blue for Clinton. Um, some of those states that ultimately didn't. And the big question whenever we're looking at larger political dynamics is if something happens just for one candidate or just for one election cycle, we'd say, oh, it's a blip. Oh, it was something. It's not a trend. Right. Uh, but, but sometimes those things are indicative of a larger change. And there'd be a lot of different dynamics here that if we look at 2020 and then 2024 and then 2028, if that stays the same, the blue wall no longer exists. That tells us of a major shift in American politics. And this will just be the first election after 2016. But, but again, in terms of states that I'm looking forward to seeing in a region, I think those are some of the highlights that I'd encourage folks to look out for. It's great to hear your perspective, uh, uh, an offshoot question. You're teaching political science. What are your students saying? What are they telling you? What is interesting to them at this point as they look at the, the election for 2020? It's fun because with college students, uh, <laughs> I get older and they always stay the same. It's fresh eyes that for many of them, this is the first time they really paid attention to a presidential election. You know, 2016 was back when they were in high school. They may not have known or necessarily cared. And so a lot of them are looking at this saying, 
I think there's a bit of a disappointment that they were recognizing from an electoral college perspective, Indiana doesn't matter as much. And certainly we have really exciting races I know you and I will talk about. So it's not, not to dissuade anyone, we matter. But, but in the overall scheme of things for the presidential election, I think they're recognizing that in a way that's probably a little discomforting. It was certainly, we're mentioning, we're talking about this after the first presidential debate. And I had the opportunity to do a virtual debate watch party with my students. And many of them were, I think, disgusted, appalled, uh, disappointed in terms of the candidates and who's representing the two major political parties. Uh, on one hand, I, I share their frustration and I can understand where they're coming from. This is their entree to American politics. This is the first time they can vote. And, and they see these two old white men in their 70s yelling at each other. <laughs> And they, they may not agree with them on the issues and they're starting to wonder if, if this is the best option. They, they feel a little discouraged. But I, I think on the other hand, this is a great moment in American politics. And this is an opportunity for, I don't mean change in that traditional sense people always say it in politics, but, but for these students to see, okay, this is what the landscape looks like. We have the opportunity to envision something differently. You know, and um, whether you want to vote whichever way you do, I, I, I think that kind of, aggression, that frustration, that excitement, whatever your energy and emotion is, that can fuel and motivate behavior and engagement. And that's always my hope is whether they're happy or mad, um, they're able to act and do something wisely and, and intelligently about it. So I, I'd say they have a lot of emotions there. Yeah, I was going to say you mentioned students being a little disappointed of maybe of Indiana not mattering as much. Well, Indiana has certainly mattered in, in the U.S. Senate in recent years with, with key races uh you know in the last two or three election cycles no such race this time in indiana but the, the u.s senate in general when looking at you know we have the 53 republicans currently it seems to be a handful of battleground states what what do you see as being some of the keys to to who ends up with control of the senate i'm glad you mentioned it because you're right we do have a off year we we don't have a battle this year round we will in 2022 um but but looking at some of those major races i i think with the republican balance uh, certainly mitch mcconnell's seat has gotten a lot of attention and i'm not sure amy mcgrath will be able to unseat him just based on the dynamics in kentucky it's it has some blue elements but by and large it does tend to be more of a republican state i, I think looking at a whole the Senate Republicans do have an advantage to keep that majority. Um, for Democrats, are going to have to be looking at races, like I mentioned, McGrath's, but also those open seat opportunities. And we've seen a lot of money flooding in, particularly for a presidential election year, where oftentimes money is going to be um, funneled to the top. People are looking at the presidency and maybe not looking at everything else down ballot like a Senate race. Um, I think those op open seats can be seen as opportunities for the Democrats. But when you're looking at the balance that we see right now, even though it seems relatively close, it, it does certainly bias, I think it certainly advantages Republicans. It's theirs to lose, and I, I think it's going to be harder for them to do that. Um, as far as all the races go, you know, in terms of institutions, I don't think the Senate is really a hot one necessarily to cycle just because of the numbers and the way the balance is. We do have a high profile race in the Indi for the U.S. House here in Indiana, though. Uh, so Susan Brooks was was our Indiana Chamber Government Leader of the Year, I believe her second year in office back in 2014. Her retiring, strong national involvement already for both the Republican Victoria Sparks uh, and Democrat Christina Hale. Thoughts on that race and, and key things to watch there? Well, it is an exciting race. And I'm. It, it's kind of nice. A lot of times when we look at our congressional representatives, the way the seats are in terms of the district demographics it seems to be really clear that the first and seventh are going to go democrat and all the others are going to be republican when we're looking at brooks's seat that she's since retiring from we know she'll have a female successor whether or not it's sparts or hale it, this seems to be one of the most competitive races not just of course here in indiana but nationwide and we've seen a lot of money come into it i think when it comes down to it the voter turnout is going to matter in this race and particularly when you look at the fifth district uh, it's pretty unique as far as districts go. It has elements of urban area, elements of suburban, almost farmland. It truly has it all. It's a very Indiana as far as that goes. And so looking at the way which voters turn out, which voters are enthused, I think that's probably going to be the biggest factor in terms of the indication of, of the outcome there. But this is a district that has been fairly solidly red 
um, since Brooks has had it. If you look at the Cook Partisan Voting Index, the CPVI, they rate the districts based on how partisan they think it is. And it's, it has been very red. Hale has the opportunity for Democrats to potentially flip this. Of course, Sparse is going to hold, try and hold on to it for Republicans. But I, I'm glad you mentioned it because I would highlight it. This is a race to watch, not just again in Indiana, but across the country. And one thing that Democrats are looking forward to, as Republicans are, in that House balance, uh, as important as we finish the census and we get ready for redistricting, those numbers in the House really matter. Uh, Jeff Brantley, our political expert here at the chamber, has talked about you know, not just that race, but the, the change being seen in Hamilton County, for example, yes. in, in other suburbs around around the state. Uh, just a, a lot of, of more competition probably than there's been in the past. Is, is that a trend? Is that a demographic that you've looked at? Oh, I, I know with suburbs, this has become a, an increasing focus for us, um, in part because of, of turnout, but also the competition you see in the candidates and in these districts that are represented within the suburbs. It's hard yet to say whether or not this is a trend. And we can look back to 2019, so just going back to a year ago where we had local municipal elections, and there were places where you saw Democrats succeed that really traditionally would be more Republican, and vice versa. You saw places where Republicans uh, were very successful and would have have been normally uh, democratic areas. Local elections make it really hard to generalize because they're often focused on local issues. They're, they're not nationalizable, if that's a word here. <laughs> it's hard to make them uh, on a, a larger scale. So it's difficult to say whether or not it's a trend. And I know that's the question you asked, but what I would say is it's worth looking out to seeing. Because as we look over the next couple election cycles, if, if this is truly a hot spot, it's going to redefine Indiana politics, certainly. And it also kind of redefines what we look for in a campaign and what campaigns have to do in order to be successful with voters. Yeah, we keep hearing one of the impacts of 2020 and, and the pandemic is the, is the potential of people moving from urban cores into more of the suburbs. So that could be a factor in how this plays out going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're finishing the census and granted that will have already taken place, but the redistricting numbers and where population redistributes is always uh, politically important. So in what I would call, again, the most unusual year of 2020, we have a bit of an unusual race for governor here in the state. I say unusual in, in the respect of, of Governor Holcomb is, is front and center, uh, you know, originally, initially every day, and now certainly still on a regular basis on how our state is dealing with the pandemic. So certainly a unique opportunity there. While uh, Woody Myers, the Democrat challenger, has has been a little under the radar, I think it's safe to say, not not my analysis, but one which certainly we've seen from others. Your, your thoughts on that race and, and how the, all those, those factors are coming together? First of all, I think it's always hard to run for governor in Indiana because we're one of a handful of states that actually has a governor's race coinciding with the presidential, which is most unfortunate because there's going to be a lot of attention, a lot of money that's going to be siphoned uh, to the presidential. And then you have the coattail effect for better or for worse. And sometimes it's advantageous for candidates. Sometimes it actually hurts them. We're going to have that impact based on your party and what the party nominee is for president that you share a party with. That said, it is, it's a very unusual race. And I think uh, Woody Myers never seemed to quite get the traction, get the, quite a, the attention that he was hoping to garner. There for a while, you had a couple Democrats who had their hat in their race, but kind of took it out early. Uh, for Holcomb, he's had the, I would say in this case, added benefit of having many um, public hearings, many uh, media news clips because of COVID. And I know there is some question you know, in terms of the state requirements, wearing a mask right, and other things that went on across the state that, that got some attention, maybe some controversy. But I was asked recently by a national news outlet, is this going to impact his chances of reelection? And I genuinely don't think it will because I, I don't think anyone's going to run from the right over to the left, ideologically speaking, because they don't like the way that Holcomb handled mask wearing, for example. Uh, but he did get free press if you will, in terms of those opportunities to talk about COVID. And generally speaking, he's been seen as a, a popular, if not well-known governor, but that might not be a really bad place to occupy right now in this time of American politics. So um, it seems like a, a lackluster gubernatorial election in some ways. And I say that with regret to both candidates. And in all three candidates, there's a strong libertarian candidate there too. Uh, just not as much attention, not as much hype, not as much focus as we'd see even 
given the fact that we always elect our governors on presidential years. Just doesn't seem to have the same kind of energy, unfortunately, this time around. Well, you talked about those coattails, certainly, and they, and they were big in 2016 for, for Governor Holcomb. Uh, could be less so this time, but but as we look at, at Governor Holcomb and Dr. Myers, you know, I, I think it's fair to describe them as moderate candidates in a in a, in a policy, in a political world that is, is clearly much more polarized. Uh, do you Talk about that, the, you know, kind of that moderate versus polarization dynamic. Interestingly enough, this might be a way in which it hurts them from a getting attention perspective. Uh, but uh, something that makes me admire them a little bit more as candidates, because it seems to be true to who they are, and not just as candidates and campaigns, but, but as people themselves. They, neither of them seems to have a, a really strong ideological bent, really, really representing the hardcore left or the hardcore right. And when you look at Meyer's track record and Holcomb's track record, as you said, uh, they're remarkably moderate. And I, I say remarkably because I think in this day and age of polarization, people are pulled, they're twisted. It's easy to go to the extremes as a lot of times that's the that's what you hear. That's the squeaky wheel, if you will. That's, that's the strong part of the political party that's going to want to get you there. Uh, in, for whatever reason, these candidates are, are much more moderate. They've resisted that poll. They've <laughs> gone against it. I'm not sure how they've, how they've done it. Uh, but I think this is to the benefit of the voters because you get a sense, I believe this is truly where the candidates are, not again, just as candidates, but as people. Uh, both, of course, being moderate sometimes makes it harder for voters to disentangle them and to decide who they'd support. Of course, because it's a statewide election, they do have partisanship as a cognitive shortcut to rely on. So they can go based on how they feel about the political parties. But, but there are some small differences. And I, I think it's important always for voters to make sure that they reference those and they get a good sense of what the candidates stand for before they vote. So Laura, if the governor's race suffers a bit from being, let's say, in the shadow of the presidential contest, if we go down to the state house, the legislative races down, you know, maybe again, another level down on the ballot, certainly below the gubernatorial race. Uh, talk about those. And I guess really are, would, are those races more impacted by COVID-19 and the, the, the lack of the, maybe the traditional campaigning that takes place at that local level? I believe they are. And I would argue that this is going to advantage those incumbent candidates. So people who are already serving, people who have franking privileges, people who have name recognition, uh, they might have a bit of a war chest, right? they can engage in uh, maybe non-traditional campaigning and they'll still have enough of a base to be successful. Like you said, this is going down the ballot even further. And a lot of times we consider state level elections when we talk about your state legislature as being low information elections, meaning Many people don't necessarily know what their state legislature does. Uh, they don't know what their state legislator, the individual, does or what they stand for. And, and they don't have a great sense of who's competing, who's running against each other. Now, how, how do they offer differences in terms of policies? All the things that you'd really want to know, ideally, to make a good informed decision at the ballot box. So because of that, they're going to rely on other cognitive shortcuts, right? And they'll rely on other things to make up their mind. Eh? I mentioned I think this is going to advantage those incumbent candidates. And of course, we'll wait and see if I'm right in this estimation. But for people who have already been in public service, I know I've gotten flyers from my representatives and my state senators saying, look, this is what we've done in office. This is what we continue to do, especially amid a time of an, an unprecedented international pandemic. Voters may feel more comfortable going with someone who has that experience rather than switching it up. And, uh, and no doubt, I just add to the complexities, this is a year of complexities, isn't it? When you can't do the traditional campaigning, right, there's no knocking on doors, there's no shaking hands, there's no kissing babies' foreheads. You have to rely on a virtual format. It, that's gonna make it hard for all candidates, but if you've already been the incumbent, if you already have name recognition, if you already have a little bit of, little bit of money, some popularity, I, I think you're gonna be at a, a distinct advantage compared to someone who's trying to challenge you or even an open seat where it's going to be brand new information for all of the voters. Yeah, uh, I mentioned Jeff Brantley earlier. He, he has made the point, though, uh, I certainly, I think, would agree with what you said, but there are certain incumbents in, in Indiana House and Senate races that are facing some very serious challenges, uh, several of them here in central Indiana, due to some very focused campaigns and also bringing that suburb uh, uh, factor into play again. Well, absolutely. And I think that is where 
you know, I was speaking in generalizations, but to your point and his, there are some still hot races to watch. And, and especially when we look at these, um, I think on the, on the larger scale, a lot of times we assume at the state level, okay, they, they work on bills, they're just involved in the three or four months the state legislature meets, but in, in fact, they're involved in a lot more than that. I know I'm here on the South side and Jack Sandlin, Ashley Eason, that race seems to have a lot of attention. Then there are a lot of other dynamics going on. You can always talk about constituencies and districts and money and advertising and outreach. Uh, but, but there are some interesting races to watch. I encourage people to look and, and make sure that, of course, they're doing their best to investigate and understand, educate themselves before they vote um, to make their best decision. So, Laura, one more big picture question here, and I, I got to be careful and word this correctly because I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask your opinion of whether this is going to happen but ask, what do you think the impact will be? And that's really talking about the, the transition in power, if there is one at the presidential level or, or whoever wins the election. Uh, again, not asking you what you think is going to happen, but how important is it going forward that we have a clear result, a, a, a smooth either continuation of the current presidency or a smooth transition? How critical is that? Imperative. It is absolutely imperative. And I am grateful for how carefully you worded that question because I learned long ago I'd be a horrible fortune teller. I'm much too wishy-washy and people don't want to pay for that. Okay. I, I think it is invaluable for a democratic society, a Democrat with a lowercase d talking about values, not party here. That smooth transition of power is something that's really important so that voters feel confident in the election process itself. Uh, usually we talk about election integrity, we're talking about making sure um, people aren't voting where they shouldn't be or they're not voting more than once or, or no outside forces are influencing our elections. Uh, but this is the other side of election integrity. It's making sure that candidates, that parties, that campaigns recognize the outcome, that they trust it for being valid and that they abide by what it says. And um, I'm not a fortune teller and I don't make those kind of forecasts or predictions, but I would just say from the constitutional scholar perspective and certainly from as a political scientist, for our democracy to work in the way it should and, uh, and to give people the confidence they need in elections, we absolutely must have a smooth transition to power. And uh, that's critical. There's just no way around it. Critical is it happening. Absolutely necessary. So, so much more to come in the uh, as people listen to this in the ensuing weeks as we lead up to November. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of other areas. You know, we've been together a few times where I, I've heard Roll Tide come from you. Uh, you have multiple degrees from the University of Alabama. Uh, so we're early in this in this football season, delayed college football season. But what are your thoughts on on Alabama and college football moving forward in these uncertain times? Well, you know, I just got done saying I'm not a fortune teller, but I always assume we're going to win the national championship. That's just how much pride I have in my school. Uh, Roll Tide always and forevermore. It's been interesting to see the impact, of course, of the shortened schedule. As we speak, we came off a of victory of Missouri, but we, we still have some interesting games, I believe, yet to play. I'm not really worried about conference games so much as uh, – Clemson. <laughs> uh, already, already counting on that final. Oh, I am. Oh, Tom, I'm an optimist. I, I fully do. I have all faith in Coach Saban. Um, that I would say that race scares me. But in terms of prognoses and, and actually looking much forward to the future, I want to say this now so I get it on the record so people can refer back and say, yes, she called it. I, I tell you, I'm worried about Clemson. But, you know, Dabo Sweeney, he's an Alabama boy. And so I'm quite convinced. Nick Saban, when he ultimately retires, Dabo Sweeney's coming home. And just like Bear Bryant said, mama called. And that's so why so no, no political predictions, but you're ready <laughs> to name the next Alabama football coach. Really. You can see where my allegiance lies. And you know what's fun about this? I can combine this and tell you this is why it's really important to me as an educator to be nonpartisan, because I don't want on the football field those referees being for or against Alabama, right? Because if they're against Alabama, I'm going to hate them the whole time. I'm going to know it. I'm going to smell it. I'm not going to like it. But even if they're for us, it's like when your parents tell you you look nice and you're like, yeah, but you have to tell me I look nice. I want an impartial perspective, right? I want it to be called like it is. I want it to be called that we're the best because I believe Alabama, right? We're the best. Um, <laughs> so as, as a political educator, that's why I feel it's so important to me to be nonpartisan in my classes because I'm here to educate, not indoctrinate. I'm trying to be that impartial referee for the students. And I like to often, I associate it with Alabama football. I say, look, I would want an impartial referee because I want to know that we won, not because 
they were biased, but because ultimately they thought we were best. So what's the most memorable Alabama football game you've ever been to? Well, I can tell you that when it's uh, November 2011, it was game of the century. It was against LSU. I took my dad. I had, I actually got two tickets. I had a ticket as a student and I had another ticket, long reason, could have sold it for $500. And I love reminding him of it. Most expensive gift I've ever given him, I'm afraid to admit. Uh, but we went to the game, um, stood the whole time. We used shakers, which I know a lot of people call pom-poms in the Midwest. We call them shakers. I had blisters on my fingers and my toes. Cause it's Alabama, so I wore heels, was standing. Uh, that outcome was really unfortunate. I'm sorry it's the one I remember the most because that was a 9-6 game. There were no touchdowns. It was all the field goals, right? It was all the field goals. Yes. It was oh, so depressing. And we lost. Tom, we lost. I When we had to walk back to my apartment, it was a mile. I mentioned all the blisters. I mean, I was in physical pain, but that was nothing compared to the emotional wreck I felt with my, my poor team losing. We did end up making it to the national championship and doing well, but, uh, you know, that game was memorable. Not because of the blisters, not because of the loss, not because of lack of field goals, but I got to share it with my dad. Um, and that's one of the most beautiful things I think about football, sports, probably even politics, but it's the community of it. And it was one of the things I loved. Well, you know, I can't really compete with my alma mater of Ball State because we, we've never even won a bowl game. Uh, but but let me point out that Nick Saban, your Alabama football coach, got his first his start at Toledo in the Mid-American Conference here. Of course, was at Michigan State also. Mm -hmm. And that, that LSU school you mentioned before. He, you I was, he was there for a little bit, too. And then, you know, he went up to the Dolphins and he came back to college. I mean, I think humble beginnings, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And there are actually quite a few coaches. Um, I, I always think as a college professor, there are many differences between us and football coaches, not the least of which is our salaries. But I'm grateful my career does not depend on the success of 18 to 22-year-olds. Um, playing in, in athletics. So I think that, that can be a very difficult, uh, very hard job. Thankfully, I just have to educate them, open their minds, challenge them, and then I send them on their way to the real world. And I, I still get to maintain my job, regardless of ultimately how successful they are. You just get them ready to assume those leadership roles. So, so when, you're, when you're not involved in the, in the many political and election activities or doing conversations like this or watching Alabama football, what kind of things do you enjoy? What, what, what do you do with, with, with any spare time that you have? Yeah, uh, spending time with my family, without a doubt. So I have three young children. Um, I, my oldest son does play football. He plays junior football in sixth grade. Um, especially as someone who's a football fan, sometimes it's painful to watch because you just want to be like, no, no, you got to hold on to the ball. You'd be amazed. There are more fumbles than anything I've ever seen, more turnovers than a bakery. There's, there's a lot of problems, but it's fun to watch them learn. And I, and I love sharing my passion with the game with my children. Um, my youngest two are very young. So just watching them uh, play and explore uh, it, is spending time with my family without a doubt. And I, I don't have a lot of extra time or spare time, but I, any chance I get to, I, I want to spend it with them. Well, a related question as we wrap up, we're going to ask everybody this, this season on the in chamber. Real simple, a straightforward question. You can think about it personally, professionally, but what makes a great day for Laura Maryfield Wilson? I love this question. For me, it's one where I fulfilled. Oh man, this is going to sound too big. Like I'm not a philosopher, I promise. It, it's one where I fulfilled the meaning of my life. So I made a difference for someone else. I tell my kids before they go to school, I tell my husband, and I say it kind of somewhat facetiously to him, right? Um, be brilliant and change the world. And I, I think small things change the world. I think making someone smile, um, making them think about something differently than they thought before. Uh, as a professor giving students confidence, oftentimes that's what they need more than anything. If I've had a day where I felt like I did that successfully. I felt like I, I did what I was put on here to do. Then I, I'd say that that feels good to me and that feels like a success. Excellent. Well, Laura, thanks so much for joining us, sharing your insights. So we, we have much more to, to watch and pay attention to, as, as we said, in the coming weeks as, as we move to, uh, toward the November 3rd uh, election. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Great. Before we wrap up, uh, just a couple things, uh, upcoming Indiana Chamber events. Uh, less than a week away, we have our annual Workforce Summit. Uh, there are opportunities to participate in person, but also virtually. It's a two-day event, October 19th and 20th. And again, not just the, the typical workforce challenges, but looking at ways and to, to assist your employees with training, education, mental health supports, other things to, as, as companies and individuals recover from 
from COVID-19. Uh, as mentioned previously, our annual awards celebration uh, goes virtual this year, November 10th. We'll be recognizing our business, government, uh, and dynamic leaders of the year, as well as community of the year. It's a 90-minute program, fast moving, lots going on. Uh, we encourage you to take part in that on November 10th. We will be back here in two weeks with our next conversation. Thank you as always for listening to The In Chamber. Thank you.